mention that both him, as he is now, a member of the Advisory Council of the National Research Council. So we're looking forward to, to his participation in the budgets of the National Research Council for Astronomy. <laughs> 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 Flashback uh, uh, before I leave in the future, since I'm leaving the host this morning, having decided only the last minute that I would come, that I'd be able to come because of the cold, I grabbed some slides which uh, we put up in the projector, uh, which show just how really young I am. Um, and maybe we can have a look at the, at the first slide and we'll read the lights out and probably as little as possible for, the, for one or two because they're rather underexposed. They're rather poor slides. But they're taken uh, back in uh, 1962 or 63 when I was, was an MSc student at Queen's. And uh, uh, I just thought it might be fun to see some of the people uh, who are also in this room. That is R. Covington, uh, in an early reincarnation. Uh, next slide. Um, show us another next slide, please. This is another group uh, and also shows some of the, um, this is a, a connection of some graduate students at Queen's um, as well as um, some people from NRC um, and shows some of the equipment that was at ARO at that time. That I believe is the 10 meter uh, dish. Uh, and finally there's one more slide which I thought the clear ball. for a minute. Um, the uh, final slide. Oh, that'll be I think my voice the toolbox. The final slide, uh, the reason I put it in was uh, I, 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 I remembered uh, the enthusiasm and, uh, and uh, the talents that I always admired in Bob Chisholm. Who, uh, unfortunately, he is not with us, but he really should be with us because he died at a very young age. And I thought it would be fitting to show a picture of Bob Chisholm, just in case some of you haven't met him, that's Bob Chisholm right there on the left, beside one of the old ARO antennas, which I probably believe is not there anymore, it's Bob Chisholm. <coughs> okay, thank you, uh, uh, Joe. Let, let's move on to um, uh, now the future, and I'm going to uh, roughly uh, start in parallel with Bernie Burke's comments on <coughs> uh, some exciting things being done now. Um, it's uh, clear that we've moved into an era of worldwide <coughs> ELBI with antennas being coupled between uh, intracontinent and across continents. And um, we have got to the point of making some rather impressive images, uh, in particular going from measuring diameters, as was the original uh, inspiration. Uh, at larger and larger baselines to beginning to make images and then as we made images uh, over the last uh, decade or two we've begun as you might expect on physical grounds to see dynamics in space because with the LBI you're always looking at very small scales and uh, so you're really making movies in space or you're trying to make movies in space. Now of course if you're making movies in space you need a lot of data points. Uh, you're, you're you're, you're generating a cube of data, not just a 2D data, data piece. And um, if you think of it that way, it's not easy to, it's not hard to realize that we are really at a very crude stage, even at the moment, compared with what one could do or would like to do uh, at the very high resolutions which we uh, can now achieve. In fact, 
um, what the VLA uh, and Vestiborg are now doing at, at sort of kilometer resolution, i.e. generating large cubes of data, um, is something that we would like to do uh, with VLBI, in which the third dimension is, in many cases, the time axis. Um, <clears throat> Joe, if I could have the next slide, if you're ready. This just uh, <coughs> illustrates the uh, illustrates uh, a typical collection of uh, antennas around the world, including the ill-fated CLBA, which you can see is a line across Canada. Um, and of course, it's not complete. You'll recognize that there are lots of antennas not shown there, including the ones in Japan and so on that you can't see on the other side of the Earth. Um, I think that one of the uh, interesting um, uh, things that we can look forward to in the future uh, is the fact that uh, a VLBA, as is now being constructed uh, by the United States, is uh, in effect being grown from, uh, although maybe it wasn't planned that way, it's being grown from a, a system which already exists with 27 antennas, namely the VLA. If we could have the next slide, the VLA, just in case there are some of the crowd who have not seen the VLA. Um, <clears throat> This is one of the more compact configurations of the VLA and is down sort of on the other side of the US in the previous picture. Um, but notice that, of course, that the, uh, in, uh, as you go down one arm of the VLA, the spacing between antennas gets progressively larger uh, in the logarithmic series. Uh, and if you project, if you extrapolate that, in fact, if you take the VLA and stretch the antennas out to their full 21 kilometer long arms, and then you ask what's the next jump to continue the series, you don't have to put in too much and, until you get to the next VLBA antenna, roughly, I mean, ignoring the, uh, the, the azimuthal gaps. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I can see that in the, in the relatively near future, as the VLBA uh, gets built, that the temptation will be very strong uh, to uh, put in the two or three uh, antennas in New Mexico, which will match the VLA to the VLBA, and thereby match the VLA and the VLBA to antennas elsewhere in the world and to antennas in space. And that way, it will be possible to first order to have a self-similar set of baselines in the quasi-sense, just as the VLA is itself, generates a self-similar set of baselines up to uh, 35 kilometers in, in length. Well, we all know what the VLA can do with that set of baselines very efficiently with 27 antennas. Uh, uh, the question is, what will we be able to do in VLBI with, uh, with uh, uh, antennas all around the world coupled together? Now, before I go on to uh, speculating on some of these possibilities, I want to emphasize another development in the future. The first development is matching uh, low baselines to large baselines and being able to image on a very wide range of scales. The second is moving up in wavelength, as has been the historical uh, trend in the past, starting at 75 centimeters and uh, working down in wavelength to roughly 1.3 centimeters. In fact, now we're seeing VL, the first VLBI results at a wavelength of, uh, let's see, at a frequency of 90 gigahertz. <coughs> um, and that's my point that millimeter VLBI, I think, is a very exciting uh, development. The technology is working in its favor, and we will be able to significantly increase resolutions down to something like, uh, if we observe, let's say, near the CO line of 115 gigahertz, uh, since many antennas are outfitted with that wavelength, then we'll get down to resolutions uh, of about 50 micro arc seconds just using modest baselines on the Earth. And um, with space added to that, of course, that will increase proportionally by a factor of maybe up to two for uh, nearby, or even three for nearby satellite-based antennas. <coughs> so millimeter VLBI, uh, I think, is a really exciting uh, development. Um, the next couple of slides uh, illustrate the sort of uh, things that you might see as you do that. Here is one of the nicer images 
generated recently by uh, a team of people, including uh, Ken Kellerman, who's here with us, of 3C84. It's a famous uh, and popular VLBI object because it's a very bright object, and it's also got significant structure in the center of NGC 1275. Well, this is a map made with a resolution of, of about that, the order of a milliarc second, um, <coughs> at 2.8 centimeters. And uh, up here, you can see the total spectrum of the source. And there is 2.8 centimeters. What happens now if you go up to a factor of 10 higher in frequency, then you're doing millimeter VLBI. Um, well, of course, the, the resolution goes down, down by a factor of 10, so that's what your beam width will look like. But as you can see up here, you still have as much flux uh, at uh, millimeters in this object as you had at centimeter wavelength. So there's certainly, in a sense, no problem of signal to noise, uh, and you will begin to uh, resolve all kinds of very fine structure you can predict um, that, you, that you are only, which is your, that are hopelessly resolved out on this state-of-the-art VLBI map. <laughs> And uh, the next slide shows you uh, some just general data on BL-like objects, which underline the point that I'm making. Whoops, I'm sorry. Skip on one more slide, please, Joe. <coughs> um, these are just integrated spectra of some BL-like objects, going all the way from radio to optical. Um, and notice the frequency. I better make sure I can read the frequency axis, too, from here. Uh, there is 10 to the 14 hertz. Uh, is that right? Yes, that's right, because we're going up to x-ray as well. And uh, the point I'm trying to make is that in the radio range here, the spectra of blac type objects um, and some related objects are remarkably flat, and they remain intense all the way up to, um, to hundreds of gigahertz. So um, there is a lot of signal on the sky, in the sky, at these very high frequencies deep in the millimeter band, um, which will also, you can safely predict on physical grounds, will be associated with the smallest structures that some of the smallest structures that we will be able to see. Um, so the, uh, the frontier of, of resolution is by no means uh, uh, a limit. We have a long way to go in resolution to explore some of the uh, very energetic and dynamic phenomena that we've, uh, we only have barely begun to uh, have an inkling of. Well, let me just flip back to that previous slide that you skipped over, which um, under, again is to underline my, a point I want to make about millimeter VLBI. This is a set of data baselines I put together with the help of Craig Walker at NRAO. Um, uh, just taking a list of some of the millimeter telescopes which now exist around the world, uh, that being an exception now, the second one. Uh, but you can see that we get a, a very nice collection of baselines for at least for high decks. And, uh, there, is, uh, there are enough antennas in principle to do some nice imaging, even at millimeter waves, if everything else were OK and if the atmosphere behaved. <coughs> well, on that final point, it looks as though from the, er from the recent millimeter VLBI observations, the atmosphere is not as bad as it was perhaps thought to be and probably is not going to be uh, a terrible barrier. Um, well, as we increase our resolution and uh, see smaller and smaller structures, and as we take our uh, uh, modest baselines and go to longer and longer baselines, adding more telescopes, um, but not taking away any of the low baselines, then you can see that we're going, going to be able to we're going to have to image more and more complex objects if we're going to be able to do total imaging. Um, an example of some total imaging, um, which I've been doing recently, um, and it's only one example of many is in the next slide, you'll have to jump to. <coughs> Whoops, well, there's a, never mind, just leave it. There's M82, nearby galaxy, which, whose nucleus is peppered with all kinds of little unresolved and resolved sources, in fact, structure on all scales that we can see. Um, and uh, the next slide shows you uh, what happens if you increase the resolution and just look at a little part of that radio map. Uh, this is an image which I'm working on at Toronto at the moment to uh, make a, a full image at a tenth of an arc second resolution from VLBA, VLA data. And you can see that things just break up to smaller and smaller bits. Um, the next slide shows you, uh, I'm sorry, not the next slide, but this. 
Mm. If I can switch this on. Thank you. Um, here we have, uh, I'm sticking with the same object now, M82. There's the galaxy. Uh, here is the uh, contour version of the radio map you saw a minute ago. And uh, here is a result which represents a recent triumph of VLBI, in my view. And that is an attempt uh, successfully by Norbert Bartel and uh, Erwin Shapiro and Simonetti, Markaida, and several others to uh, image uh, uh, objects at the sort of Millijansky level in the nucleus of M82. Um, and one of the first results is that the brightest source in M82, this fellow here, they have now succeeded in, in imaging, and it's only a, a few tens of Millijanskys. Um, well, uh, in principle, it should be possible to uh, soon, in a few years' time, to, to image all of these things. All of, all, of the, all these things which are point sources are presumed have interesting structures, and even this one is not completely resolved out. So why not think of making an image which is this thing here, but has, let's say, uh, 16 to 20,000 pixels on a side, and includes all of these things even with better resolution. Uh, the, in, the information is clearly there to image. What's lacking is our VLBI capability and our computing ability to, uh, to actually do the job, uh, along with some other technical limitations. Um, <clears throat> OK. Uh, so just to, um, just to uh, wind up and, and summarize um, <coughs> and emphasize a few, a few points, um, what we are going to be, what we will be doing as we go to higher and higher resolutions is imaging dynamic phenomena in high energy objects in space. And these don't have to be awfully high energy objects if we're looking, of course, at objects in our own galaxy. But I would point out that if we map objects in our own galaxy at VLBI resolutions, the ultimate resolutions that we have now, then <coughs> uh, the light uh, travel time across the objects, which presumably links to the variability scale, is shorter than 24 hours, so that if you, if you were to track the sky around, you would in fact have a problem for most distant objects in the universe. In fact, I worked out less than 20 megaparsecs you have this problem at the current highest resolutions in that the objects could vary within a 24-hour tracking time. Uh, and you can stretch that limit depending on whether you put in both relativistic motions or not. Um, uh, millimeter VLBI, which will also be increasingly dynamic and will require large numbers of antennas uh, to, make, to fill in the aperture as much as possible and to uh, avoid being confounded by dynamic effects. Um, and uh, finally, <coughs> full imaging uh, at many different wavelengths uh, using VLBI combined probably with the VLA and other more uh, short spacing antennas. So. <coughs> Uh, if I have a, do I have a two or three more minutes, uh, Paul? Um, I thought that I just made on this one sheet a little list of, uh, of what uh, might be some of the possibilities for improving very long baseline technology in the future. Um, the first is clocks. Now, there might be an, an expert in the room that is more conversant on this subject than I am, but when I visited the time standard laboratory here at the National Research Council, uh, uh, earlier this year and talked with some of the people who think about uh, clocks and how to build them, uh, there was an opinion expressed that in the, next, in the foreseeable future, perhaps within the next decade or two, it should be possible to make a clock which is 100 to 10,000 times more stable than the current hydrogen masers. Now, uh, that is an extremely exciting possibility, not only for VLBI, but for almost every version of the physics of measurement that you could imagine. Um, but certainly it will, it will be uh, most significant for VLBI if, if we even can achieve a factor of 100 in clock stability, let's say, over the next 10, 15 years. Uh, I, I don't uh, know what the technology is, so I won't try and discourse on it. It's just a rumor. Um, well, obviously, receiver sensitivity is improving, and in particular, it's improving at the, uh, the sub-centimeter, that is, the millimeter bands. Um, with SIS junction receivers and similar, uh, uh, similar techniques and also better uh, optics techniques and telescopes. 
Then, of course, the extension of baselines into space, which Bernie Burke alluded to. <coughs> um, another development which is going on and has produced quite spectacular results, as we all know, uh, are the advances in surface accuracy achieved in building significantly large telescopes. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the IRAM telescope in Spain uh, and the Maxwell telescope in Hawaii are just two nice examples of uh, amazing uh, 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 surface accuracy, which will make millimeter VLBI even easier than we perhaps thought some years ago. Well, I mentioned very large images and complex images, which we already can develop can generate with the VLA. There's no reason in principle why we can't, certainly given these previous uh, uh, developments, generate them uh, with VLBI. Um, but there will be another component needed, which is also doable, and that is imaging algorithm development, which is, uh, in my view, uh, um, something that has been underemphasized even in our imaging so far in radio astronomy using conventional uh, synthesis telescopes like the VLA. Um, and uh, finally, improving computer power. Uh, that is, uh, there's clearly a, a revolution going on in computer speed. Um, and uh, so the generation of images uh, with mind-boggling uh, data set sizes that give maps of 20,000 pixels on a side is really uh, not, uh, inter not unthinkable at all, I would, I would say. It's uh, certainly within the realm of possibility almost now and certainly with the next generation of fast computers. So uh, that's my list of of uh, what I think are credible advances in technology, except uh, the, the most uncertain one being this one because I can't discourse on it, the number one. Um, but uh, if that comes to pass, that will be most exciting. Thank you very much. Comments and questions? Yes. Maybe just a, a brief comment on the clocks. There is a hydrogen laser running at UBC at the moment which operates at a tenth of a And uh, so experiments are being done with that to see how stable it is. Uh, on a theoretical basis, it should be stable in parts of 10 to the 18th. But whether that will really be achieved in practice uh, is unknown at the present time. Uh -huh. That's interesting. No, I'm not sure if that was the, if this was the technology being referred to by my friends over in the time stand is not enough. There's also one operating at MIT. Uh -huh. Is, is yeah. it Not at MIT. Well, it might well be at MIT. It's a big place. <laughs> but I haven't heard about it. Yeah. Well, that's 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 times <coughs> in the instability mm -hmm. of what we have now. Yeah. Yes? I, I'm obviously a biologist, and I have a very simple question. Why is all of this going on? Uh, why, um, why are we being driven, you're asking, to, uh, to make better and better and more detailed images of, uh, of objects in the sky? Precisely. Um, well, and we... what is being this? What? Where is it? Why is it coming? Is anybody about that? Yeah, I think that um, I think that uh, why we're why this is uh, why we're we're uh, we're motivated to 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 get better and better images is uh, is, is, a, is due to a general um, uh, um, change in the status of astronomy. I would say over the last uh, few decades, and that is that uh, we've increasingly found that we can we can use laboratories, we can observe and study laboratories in space and learn fundamental physics from them. <coughs> Laboratories that we cannot create on Earth. So I guess one of the main driving forces is we can study and see things and measure things uh, in space laboratories that we can't uh, create here on Earth. And what we've learned so far, well, we know that there are some very exotic laboratories, I guess that's the other point, that, are, uh, that certainly uh, arouse our curiosity from a physicist's point of view. <coughs> Maybe somebody else has a yeah, well, it's, it's more to the Treasury Board. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean. Okay. Yes. Well, I would think a, a normal answer to that question would be that um, we try to understand the physical mechanisms of 
the things that are going on in the universe. And in order to understand those mechanisms, we have to get the highest possible resolution to understand the physics. And that's exactly the reason that the biologists were so excited by the development of the electron microscope and X-ray refraction. Because what hope would you have had for understanding the genetic code without getting the resolution that made this unraveling possible? It's an attempt to get down to the physics of whatever is going on, whether it's biology or it's the uh, spectrum of the <laughs> Let me give another try. <laughs> I talked about masers. We still don't know what pumps the masers, what the geometry of the masers is. What is their relation to star formation? Here's a, a remarkably ordered phenomenon in space, and we still don't understand it, but we know it has something to do with the, the birth cry of stars. Uh, if you look at quasars, you see apparent motions faster than the velocity of light. We know that you have to generate relativistic plasma somehow, and we haven't reached down to the engine yet to see how that engine works. And you can't do it without more angular resolution. So there are unknown things that we know are very exciting involving unusual order, very high energies, very high gravitational fields. We can't get at them without more angular resolution. Yeah, yeah. No doubt that what kind of work is extremely exciting and very much the cutting edge of the uh, research front. But in fact, what Dr. Morgan was getting at, in fact, it was something you've already alluded to earlier, is that in the 60s it wasn't so bad. You went into your director, you got some money. And certainly in this country, and I think it's certainly been true in the United States, that the increased bureaucratization of the whole scientific effort, particularly since the number of dollars went up so great, has made it worse increasingly harder. And what happened? If the next president that goes in, presumably the next prime minister that goes in here, really gets serious about getting budget deficits down, who is going to hurt? Well, that's the kind of questions. I mean, it's all very well for his friends to say we wanted to know about the universe. That's about cutting the ice in Washington. It's not about cutting the ice in Ottawa. And indeed, that's what's going to happen. We've already begun to see the crunch here in Canada for its growing. Uh, it's been going on seriously since about 1970. And we're a little earlier than that, and that's going to continue. So, uh, my advice is sort of one that stands and watches this kind of sadly on the sidelines, because I have to ask not to afraid too, is that you better, better learn how to deal with these, these guys, because they don't want to really hear about the universe and the wonders. And that, that would be kind of isolated. Better figure out how it might uh, work with Star Wars or something. Work up something. Well, that's a good point. Well, there's a good point there, and that is that uh, the technology that you use in pressing these frontiers that we're just describing is very closely connected with technology that's being developed in industry and in the defense industry. And so, unless you believe that these won't, uh, these will also all get cut, then there's a certain, I would say, inevitability about the continuation of these efforts. And I don't think that even if there's a massive budget cut, that uh, the efforts, the technological advances that we hope to see will be stopped. Um, we also live in an internationally competitive world in which the US and Canada have to compete with Japan. And uh, there's a limit to how much we can uh, go back to the more primitive techniques or stop our research if we're going to, in fact, compete in the international community. And again, basic research because it's all part of that. We'll see, I would say, uh, uh, won't, it, it can't, it's irrepressible. I mean, it, it just, it, it won't, I don't think it will be stopped. Um, also, I, I think that perhaps on the, on the question of uh, you know what's uh, the things that we we can see coming, will they come or won't they? Uh, I think if you look at my list that I put up, I think that they all will come. There may be a question of when, because we in this case, even though we, we need to get approval of this or that committee or this uh, and get this and that budget approved, uh, there's a certain momentum. Uh, in which you, of development in which you can see how the future is going, and so uh, it will, uh, it will, it will, uh, it will, uh, I'm sure, continue in one direction, not the backwards. I think Cam was first. Yeah, well, uh, the question you asked is certainly one that we debate a lot, and you can make the argument 
VLBI specifically. They made another specifically VLBI. Or you could use it to uh, predict earthquakes, use it for planetary <coughs> navigation. Uh, I think VLBI is going to drive the course of developing uh, high speed tape recorders, digital tape recorders, which are other applications. It's certainly going to drive the course of developing improving hydrogen majors, which have other applications. Uh, you can use this argument. Um, but that's not really the reason that we're doing it. We're doing it for the other reason, to try to understand the universe better. And I think a lot of people disagree, but I think if we can't make that argument to the politicians, and if mankind can't divert a very, very small fraction of its resources into better understanding the universe that we live in, the astronomy or biology or whatever, uh, and it's not a very good universe we live in. Mankind has been doing that hundreds of thousands of years, some pyramids or cathedrals or what have you. Uh, those guys had wars too, but they also diverted a certain amount of their resources into the arts and the sciences, and we should be able to continue to do that. And I prefer to make that argument. We may not get the money, but at least we can have the satisfaction that you know, we are doing the, the, the right thing. Huh? Well, I think I uh, very much go along with that. I think <clears throat> one who has to make those arguments these days, um, uh, I would say that I use all of the, uh, uh, the ones related to uh, uh, advancing technology and, and so forth. We'll play that for, uh, and I think it's a very valid argument, but uh, <clears throat> I, I won't be uh, ashamed to say that we also uh, want to do pure science. There are constraints on those kinds of things these days, but on the other hand, it is a valid uh, <clears throat> uh, intellectual um, adventure, and it's also, uh, <clears throat> in the case we can make to, to the politicians, at least uh, uh, in a country like Canada, that if we're going to maintain our international reputation, uh, in whatever way you look at it, whether it's uh, <clears throat> in technology or uh, uh, science, as you like, we have to do a, a component of uh, your research as well. We're going to do, we're going to do that. Okay. How does the LBI compare as far as funds are concerned with high energy particle physics? That's an expensive I what you think. I just say, yeah, what's what the, how the scientific rationale will, well, well, which, uh, which area will, uh, will... Well, one's not asking for a large amount, for me, yeah, you're not asking for a large amount of money in comparison to high energy particle physics. So I was just asking the question, how is high energy particle physics getting on? There are, there are about 10 times as many physicists are, as there are astronomers. Now, they're not all high, but let's use that as a, as a scaling number. But 10 times as cost. Uh, the superconducting super collider budget is roughly $4 billion. And one tenth of $4 billion is $400 million. And uh, I think the biggest pro projects that astronomers are contemplating these days are about half that. So as long as you stay out of space, you're not, you're within a factor of two of what the high energy physicists do. We've already built a $2 billion project. So I don't think that argument is going to go too far. Well, no, there is the, the, the space is a curious one. Yeah. That is, uh, okay, that, you that, ring in space, but what fraction of that is keeping Lockheed and, and what fraction of the and Perkin and the is going to keep cutting edge? That is, uh, that, that's a different accounting. I, I refuse to accept $2 billion on my account. Even though I probably wrote glowing letters. Let's put you, Mr. Bolden, when we were You hold it against us. I just think we should ask what did Columbus use as an argument for getting Queen Isabella to support his ships to America? I suspect he used <coughs> exploration. I would hate to see us desert. Riches. The riches. Is that really true? Uh, I, mean, I have the impression it was more than economic riches. He may have gone for exploration. Yeah. Yeah. The argument he used was more economic. Well, I think people, even in those days, had some concept of the excitement of finding out. Certainly the Greeks did. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I would hate to see us desert this pure concept of curiosity. 